Dr. Tokuyama is an assistant professor at the University of British Columbia in the Department of Microbiology and Immunology, where she just opened her lab. Her work is centered on the interaction between viruses and the immune system. As an undergrad, she started working with HIV research, and later she obtained her PhD in molecular and cellular biology at the University of California, Berkeley, where she studied how immune cells kill cells infected with herpes viruses. After that, for her postdoc, she worked at the Yale University in the Department of Immunobiology, where she became fascinated by the endogenous retroviruses. Dr. Tokuyama's current research focuses on understanding how these endogenous retroviruses affect the immune system both in health and in disease. In the past year, Dr. Tokuyama has also been part of the Yale IMPACT team to develop a rapid saliva-based qPCR assay for SARS-CoV-2 and researched some of the immunological impacts of COVID-19. We at the Carlos Chagas Filho Biophysics Institute would like to sincerely thank Dr. Tokuyama for this talk. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and, and share my, my screen um, and please let me know if there are any issues. Um, okay. It's rolling, just one second. Yeah, we can see your screen. We, yeah, we are now on PowerPoint. Perfect. Great. Um, yes. So again, thank you. Thank you all for this invitation. Um, you know, in this time of COVID and, and, and challenges and difficulties associated with the pandemic, sort of despite that, the silver lining is that we can connect with each other um, over Zoom and video in this manner. So this is this is really fantastic. And, and I'm really excited to share um, my research and my uh, work with you. Um, so as Fabio mentioned, I am uh, currently an assistant professor at University, University of British Columbia, and I just wanted to give a, a quick land acknowledgement. Um, as a scientist, you know, working in the University of British Columbia, um, we live and learn on the traditional and ancestral and unceded lands of the Musqueam Nation of the Coast Salish peoples. Um, and so I just wanted to give that acknowledgement um, up ahead and uh, share with you our research. Okay, so we all know, um, and you are all very familiar with the fact that um, our bodies are actually outnumbered by microbes. Um, so collectively, we have a collection of bacteria um, in, in, in a micro, uh, called the microbiome. Um, and, and this com consists of trillion cells and, and roughly a thousand species. And I think we can now um, say, you know, very confidently that the microbiome actually affects um, everything in our physiology um, and in health. And really, um, you know, the last couple of decades have really um, illuminated that the microbiome is really important for everything, including pathogen clearance, inflammation, development of autoimmunity, cancer, metabolism, aging, and beyond. Um, it, and so, you know, this is, is very well established and uh, many investigators um, are uh, you know, doing really great research in this field. Um, what is sort of the less um, well-known cousin of the microbiome is, is the viral. So the virome um, is, uh, you know, in parallel to the microbiome, except these are viral components. Um, and the virome consists of uh, viruses that many of us um, actually carry and harbor um, currently as you listen to this talk. Um, so these are viruses that, you know, you, you have been exposed to at some point in your life, um, during childhood, during adult life. Um, and, it, you know, a well, exa a well a known example is a herpes virus or herpes simplex virus, like the cold soul virus, right? Um, you've been exposed to these viruses throughout life. Um, it, it, and, and they actually um, stay, remain latently, latent in, in all of our bodies. So they do not cause overt disease on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, but we, you know, carry these viruses with us for, for life. And um, that, in, you know, this consistent, persistent interaction between these viruses and the immune system can potentially impact our health. Um, in, in much the similar, uh, in, in, this, in a similar manner as the, the microbiome. Um, and so the human virome is composed of, again, um, again a number of viruses and 
Um, what we're really interested in in understanding is really how these viruses and, and the viral components um, interact with uh, immune cells and how that in turn affects um, antiviral, antimicrobial responses or um, how we respond to chronic inflammation. And so this is, um, the, this idea really comes from um, a, a Dr. S uh, Herbert Version at Washington, Washington University um, in St. Louis. Um, th their lab has been working on this for a very long time. And, and, and this, you know, our research really is, um, has been driven by the excitement of uh, his, his, for, his research, former research. And so just to give you an example, um, in one of the, pro uh, one of the work that um, that has come out of uh, Skip Version's lab, um, modeled this uh, interaction between gamma HV68, the immune cells, and then how um, you respond to Listeria monocytogenes. So this was all done in vivo in mice. Um, and, and what they were asking is, does prior um, infection by gamma HV68 affect the outcome to Listeria monocytogenes infection? And so here what you're looking at is um, uh, mice infected with gamma HV68 one day prior to Listeria monocytogenes infection. And you see that um, looking at the survival curve, there's no difference between mock infected or gamma HV68 infection in, uh, um, in response to Listeria. Um, here. But what you can see here and what's really amazing is that um, if you infect mice four days before or 12 weeks before with gamma HV68 and then come in with Listeria monocytogenes, then this um, persistent interaction that the immune system, um, uh, the, the persistent interaction between gamma HV68 and the immune system um, really uh, gave these mice the survival benefit when they were infected with, with Listeria monocytogenes. And, um, you know, this paper um, revealed that this was dependent on interferon gamma. Um, and um, there were other mechanisms that this paper um, uh, revealed. And, and I think that this is a really great evidence that, um, uh, you know, a, pr a prior interaction between sort of the viral components, persistent viral infection, you know, way past its clearance time, and the immune system can really impact how um, the organism responds to a secondary uh, uh, a st secondary infection or secondary stimuli. And so we're really interested in this um, idea and focusing specifically on how endogenous retroviruses or ERVs, which are at the top of this list in um, sort of the, the contribution to the human viral metagenome and how these herbs interact with our immune system and how that um, impacts our, our health and, and disease outcomes. And so um, just to give you a couple more examples, this is not, um, there are many examples that have been shown in the past where uh, herpes viruses or prior um, viral component viral infections can um, lead to differential outcomes or even um, cause some, some of these um, diseases. And so, for example, cytomegalovirus um, has been shown to affect outcomes to influenza. Um, there's been a long-standing study looking at interaction between prior herpes virus infection um, and seropositivity to HSV, to HIV, um, so on and so forth. And so this idea of um, a viral origin of disease outcomes is not something new, and, and, but we're really trying to understand the mechanism um, of, of this, um, uh, of, uh, of the viral origin of these diseases. And so, um, so we focus on endogenous retroviruses. And, and so what are endogenous retroviruses? Well, um, our human, um, all of our human genomes actually um, consist of 8% of our genome consists of endogenous retroviruses. And, um, and that's present in all of the, the human genomes. And so unlike other viruses in the virome that you have to be exogenously exposed to, endogenous retroviral sequences are actually already present in all of our human genomes. And they belong to a larger class of, um, uh, a class of sequences called the transposable elements. And this collectively with ERS, DNA 
transposons, lines, and signs, they actually make up 40% uh, of the genome. And this is really in stark contrast to 2% um, of the genome that encode for protein, um, which you know we ba have based all of our understanding of our biology and health and disease on um, to this date. And I think uh, what, I, what we're interested in is really trying to reveal more about the functionality of these endogenous retroviruses and transposable elements in, in health and disease. And so when this, um, when the human genome was uh, sequenced back in 2001, um, Eric Lander and um, collectively Eric Lander and um, many institutions uh, and, and, um, and investigators published this report um, uh, revealing the composition of the human genome. And one of the things that in this paper, in this 2001 Nature paper that they published, um, it, they, they mentioned, and I kind of wanted to bring this up here because I think it's, um, you know, really revealing of what we, how much, how little we know about these sequences. So repeats are often described as junk um, and dismissed as an uninteresting. However, they actually represent an extraordinary trove of information about biological processes. And these repeats consists, constitute a rich uh, paleontological record holding crucial clues about evolutionary events and forces. And so, you know, despite the fact that these sequences were formally thought of as, you know, junk or dark matter or 98% of the genome that doesn't code for anything, I think we're really starting to appreciate and, and, and starting to slowly beginning to understand um, how these elements are actually relevant in disease and, and not just as uh, fossil records, but I think um, important for our, for our health. Um, Okay, and so these um, transposable elements collectively are found throughout, not just in human genomes, but throughout eukary eukaryotic genomes. Um, so they can be found in algae, uh, they can be found in, in, in corn maize, rice, you know, in, in, in ver a variety of eukaryotic genomes. And, and each genomes consist of sort of different proportions of a uh, transposable element class. Um, and this, uh, this has been a, a, a work that's been work, I mean, the transposable element uh, research has been going on for decades. This is not something that just started. Um, and in fact, Barbara McClintock, Dr. Barbara McClintock, won the Nobel Prize in 1983 for discovering um, the role, the essential role of transposable elements in regulating gene expression in, in corn maize. And so this idea that, you know, transposable elements are important, they're not junk, um, and they're actually have functional roles in biology has been um, uh, looked at for uh, even prior to the human genome sequences uh, sequencing, um, and I think we're now at a stage where we can working we can continue and, and expand upon uh, um, such work. And so, um, as I mentioned before, 8% of the genome are encode LTR endogenous retroviral elements, and that's four times more than the genome. Uh, the protein coding sequences. And so where do these come from um, and what do they do? I wanted to give you a quick background on and what we think, um, where, where we think they came from and, and you know, some known, uh, so, some, some uh, research on what we know about, what about these sequences. And so we think that these retroviral sequences um, uh, arose in the human genome initially through um, exogenous infection by retroviruses, um, very much in a similar manner as HIV infection, except this happened, you know, in our ancestral genomes millions and millions of years ago. And so, as you know, retroviral um, retroviral replication cycle um, includes this step where the viral RNA turns into, um, is reverse transcribed into viral DNA. And this double-stranded DNA is integrated into the host genome. And once it's integrated into the host genome, it can actually be transcribed um, similar to any other um, cellular um, genes and, and generate protein. Um, and then this leads to uh, propagation of, of retroviral, retroviruses. And so, um, you know, this, this integration step is key to the retroviral genome and it's, and it's very unique, uh, unique to retroviruses. And so we 
uh, there's um, studies and based on, you know, many, many investigators research, we know that um, this integration event must have happened uh, millions of years ago in, um, in discrete times in our ancestral genomes. Um, and so different families of herbs that we now uh, have or sequences that we have in our um, genome have been, in, we think, origina originated um, from different points through evolution. So, um, for example, the peak um, invasion events we, th uh, we think happened 40, 30 to 40 million years ago. Um, however, uh, there are, um, there remain some endogenous retroviruses that we think uh, integrated specifically into the Homo sapien um, uh, genome. And so these are the IRVK family of, of IRV sequences, of, of retroviral sequences um, that are, are purely Homo sapien specific. And, and I'll um, kind of come back to this later. But we can see that, you know, integration events happen throughout evolution. And this is what we've um, carried. And so um, carry through evolution. And so just sort of um, an idea of how this could have happened and would have happened is um, various integration events happened, occurred in, um, the, in the genome of our ancestral, our, our primate ancestors. And um, in some of these, obviously, integration events, you know, did not um, survive through evolution, right, and did not get fixed into the genome. However, there are um, lines of, uh, of retroviral sequences that have um, that became fixed and and then eventually got um, uh, in, in eventually got inherited through generations and and that's what we see sort of today and so these sequences that we we see today are those that um, have survived sort of uh, through evolution and have become um, fixed into the genome okay so when this initial integration event occurred, we um, these you know similar to other retroviral sequences, they um, integrated into our genome as proviral sequences or proviral herbs, um, and again similar to other retroviruses, these are um, the structure of these proviral proviral herbs um, is as such here. So there are two flanking LTR sequences on both the five prime and three prime end. Um, and, in, um, and, and that is flanking internal sequences that actually encode for viral proteins like gag, pull, and envelope. Um, however, through um, you know, many uh, generations in evolution, uh, generations of, uh, of uh, uh, many, uh, through many generations, um, these proviral herbs have actually acquired um, large deletions, and and also many of them have undergone homologous recombination via the the LTR, the repeats, the long terminal repeats, and so most of actually the sequences, herb sequences that are remaining in the human genome um, take the form of solo LTRs, so just a single LTR that arose from homologous recombination between five prime and three prime LTR, or internal sequences that have been, um, uh, that that has resulted as, as uh, uh, resulted from large deletions. And so, um, it, but however, um, there are still remains um, proviral sequences in the genome that do still maintain this um, proviral structure with LTR, LTR, and, and viral proteins um, in the, in, in between. Um, so just to give you an example of what these LTR sequences do functionally, um, so what we know is that these herb LTRs, or at least these solo LTRs, um, uh, are, act, are really efficient um, regulators, cis regulators of gene expression. So as a long terminal repeat promoter, um, if they lie upstream of a, uh, a known protein coding gene, a cellular gene, it can actually serve as alternative promote promoters and enhancers. And this has been shown for um, many, many genes now. And, um, and these are just examples of genes that I'm just highlighting here. Um, so, so what does this actually look like experimentally? Just to give you an example, so this, this was a beautiful work done by Cedric Fischelt's lab back in 2016, where um, they actually uh, looked at this MIR41 LTR element that's upstream 
stream of this gene AIM2. Um, and uh, they found that the SMEAR41 LTR sequence uh, encoded um, a STAT binding site that is responsive to interfering gamma. And so when you treat um, cells with interfering gamma, uh, you see that AIM2 expression goes up. Um, and, and what was really um, exciting was that when they deleted the MIRA41 um, LTR element that's upstream of AIM2, a, um, AIM2 was no longer responsive to interfering gamma. So really suggesting that these LTR elements can serve as an efficient promoter for, for genes. Um, um, and on the flip side, sort of proviral herbs have also been um, shown to have various functions, important functions in biology, and here are some examples. So um, proviral herbs that are transcribed as uh, similar to cellular genes as polyadenylated um, transcripts, um, and they can actually form long non-coding RNAs to regulate gene expression, and this has been well doc uh, has been um, shown in um, the case for embryonic stem cell development. Uh, we also know that these polyadenylated transcripts proviral derived from proviral herbs can generate viral proteins, including gag, pull, and envelope. And so, and, and just to um, illustrate this point, so these, you know, virally encoded proteins are, um, by nature, they're supposed to um, encode for, for example, envelope is supposed to be uh, for um, to, to, to form the envelope of virions and viruses. But in this case, these proviral sequences are actually integrated into the genome. So instead of forming um, virions, they can also further be expressed on cells that um, uh, can transcribe this region encoding the envelope. Um, and so not only are they viral envelopes, but now you can have these um, viral proteins expressed on um, on cells uh, and can have functional consequences there. And so one really well-established example of this is uh, syncytion 1, uh, which is actually derived from an ERVW envelope protein. And so syncytion 1, um, you can see here, is, is highly expressed in the human placental tissue. Um, this is negative control, and this is a stain for ERVW envelope. Um, and what we know from various studies, including those listed here, is, is that um, syncytion protein is really important. Um, and they're, they're really important for um, this interaction between the maternal and fetal blood. And so they're expressed by syncytial trophoblast. And it really provides this um, nice structure, this ST1 and ST2 structure, um, that, forms the, uh, that forms a really nice um, uh, epithelial barrier between the maternal blood and fetal blood to have really nice exchange um, between the fetus and, um, and maternal blood. And, and so this is uh, one really good example of a functional um, uh, envelope protein derived from endogenous retroviruses. And RFW has further been shown to, it, you know, independently of this phenotype, um, have been shown to modulate the immune system. Uh, they've been shown to activate monocytes um, through a TLR4 engagement. Um, some ERV envelope proteins encode an immunosuppressive domain in the transmembrane region, and that can actually have impact on T cell and B cell um, function. And, and furthermore, um, although uh, more rare, um, there, there is evidence that um, ERV, proviral ERVs can lead to production of viral-like particles. Um, they can, ERV proteins can be present on exosomes. Um, and, and, and they've uh, also been shown to have antiviral um, function as sort of truncated, er, uh, envel truncated envelope proteins. And so, you know, Although this, the, our understanding of herbs and biology is still at its infancy, um, there's really growing evidence suggesting that these are clearly not junk, they're clearly not um, just sort of genomic fossils, um, and there's more sort of beyond um, what we've uh, originally thought of as, a, as, um, as important uh, function of herbs. And I think there is more, more function associated with these herbs that's important for biology. Um, and so, you know, that, that's sort of um, at, in the absence of disease. And we actually now have um, 
a lot of evidence suggesting that herbs are highly dysregulated in various um, disease settings. So neurodegenerative disease, diseases like MS, ALS, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, and autoimmune diseases like MS, SLA, type 1 diabetes, and, and RA. Um, and we also know that um, in uh, various cancer settings, herbs are also dysregulated and they are um, being sought after as sort of new tumor associated antigens that can be targeted. Um, and so I think there's growing evidence that um, there's just regulation of herbs and disease. And, um, and, and I think our understanding what sort of what we're still trying to understand is the mechanism of how these dysregulated herbs contribute to disease pathogenesis um, and, and what their roles are sort of in immunity. Um, in, in part one, uh, one mechanism by which these herbs are dysregulated, um, we think is through disruption of um, epigenetic silencing of herbs. So um, uh, again, there's a, a, a really great body of evidence and research showing that endogenous retroviruses can be um, silenced epigenetically by um, the sequence specific crab zinc, zinc finger proteins. And crab zinc finger proteins actually bind to its, uh, its target in a sequence specific manner, recruit um, uh, 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 histone uh, methyltransferases and DNMTs to actually then um, add silencing uh, histone marks um, and, and DNA methylation marks. And so, and, and this, this is uh, one major form by which endogenous retrovirus are repressed. And so in cases where there are herb expression, um, uh, the likely scenario that's uh, occurring is that there's reduced epigenetic silencing that is then resulting in um, expression of these endogenous retroviruses transcripts and then furthermore uh, protein. Okay, so um, my lab and my research thus far in my lab um, is really interested in um, understanding, you know, given the fact that we know endogenous retroviruses can be expressed um, in the context of disease, in the context of um, sort of reduced epigenetic silencing in various scenarios, um, how do these endogenous retroviruses then interact with the immune systems or impact the uh, impact immune cell function? And then how does that then relate or affect and influence um, development of uh, chronic inflammation or, or um, uh, potentiation of a chronic inflammation, um, or how they, you know, could potentially contribute to antiviral responses. And so the work that um, for for the for the most part, the path that we take is. Um, is uh, sort of this approach that we take is using RNA sequencing to really dissect what the proviral herb expression are in healthy and disease. Um, and then we uh, use this RNA sequencing data to sort of define clinical correlates and determine immunomodulatory functions. And so one of the um, biggest challenges in this um, when I first started um, at Yale was that there were actually, despite the fact that there was increasing amount of RNA sequencing data available starting around 2010, 2012, um, uh, the, there were still challenges and limitation to studying herbs in RNA sequencing data simply because they are highly repetitive in nature. There are multiple copies per, per species. Um, there weren't too many bioinformatic pipelines at the time uh, that were specifically targeted to endogenous retroviruses. They were, these sequences were normally just thrown out in your standard cellular um, analysis. Um, and it was also difficult to obtain locus specific endogenous retroviral expression analysis. Um, and furthermore, it was complicated by the fact that the, um, the genome annotation didn't contain um, all of the endogenous retroviruses, especially the proviral sequences that have been shown by others in, in the past. And so we really wanted to focus on um, our efforts on trying to develop a computational pipeline to anal analyze RNA sequencing data, specifically pro for proviral endogenous retroviruses um, in a lo locus-specific manner. So. Um, we uh, ended up developing a pipeline called IrvMap, um, and this is something that we had published in 2018, where we compiled um, 
formally published proviral herb sequences that were not um, annotated in the human genome. Um, and then we designed a pipeline um, to specifically um, address the challenges of mapping uh, repetitive elements. Um, and then furthermore, we developed a web tool that was associated with this. And so using this herb map, we found um, you know, very, uh, very interesting data that has then led to sort of our further studies in, in disease models. So just to give you a couple of examples, um, we found that ERV transcriptome is actually distinct in different cell types. So what you can see is that just using ERV transcript expression alone, we can actually dis distinguish different cell types. So each cell type um, going, you know, there are different cell types uh, tiled across in this column, and each row represents an independent ERV locus. You can see that um, depending on what, what cell type we're looking at, there are very unique signatures of endogenous retroviruses, and that alone discriminates different cell types. So we can look at this in this PC plot here. We can also see this in a different way using a TISNI map where each of these dots represents an endogenous retroviral locus. And so, for example, these cells uh, express all of these herbs, whereas um, these K562 um, cell line expresses a completely independent set of endogenous retroviruses. Um, and so you can really see that um, you know, these uh, just beyond sort of cellular gene expression or protein coding genes that ERV transcriptome itself is also uh, very unique and different depending on cell type, uh, different cell types that you're looking at. Um, we've confirmed this, uh, some of this data, um, RNA-seq data by qPCR, and, and we see um, sort of despite our, you know, our, our, our new uh, pipeline, um, we can actually see that there's really good concordance between RNA-seq analysis and, and qPCR data. Um, and so we were really happy with the fact that our um, RNA-seq data analysis seems to um, really mirror what you would find by uh, qPCR as well. We can also use our ErvMap database to um, look at look through um, ChIP-seq database. Even though our pipeline is, is designed to analyze RNA-seq sequencing data, our annotation database of the ERV can actually be used to look at histomarks at these specific um, loci. So for example, um, we're looking at um, H3K4 trimethylation mark in uh, samples that are expressing constitutive levels of in, uh, in this ERV K3-1 endogenous retrovirus. I mean, you can see that consistently all of the, the cell, cell lines are um, possess this mark, um, this activation mark, whereas um, in, in other uh, cell types where um, K562 is the only cell line that actually express, um, in this case, 4503 4, locus endogenous retrovirus as you can see that um, the H3K4 trimethylation nicely sort of mirrors this, um, uh, this uh, the RNA sequencing expression data as well. And so I think this is really encouraging. That suggests that, um, again, there is um, epigenetic control of these endogenous retroviruses. And what we see at the transcript level is reflective of um, the epigenetic marks that are present um, at these loci. And in, in, in this is one example of, of such phenotype. Um, so we can further use um, this pipeline to look at disease tissues. So for example, in this, um, in this paper, we looked at breast cancer tissue samples from TCGA, and we observed a number of sort of differentially expressed endogenous retroviruses, each dot representing an endogenous retroviral loci. So these are locus-specific expression profile. And what we can do now, um, because we have locus-specific um, analysis and we can compare it to cellular gene expression, um, per individual, we can see a correlation between um, expression of herbs and expression of any immune signature. In this case, we looked at cytotoxic T cell signatures, and we can see that um, there are a number of endogenous retroviruses that um, correlate highly with, per individual, um, correlate with cytotoxic T cell signatures, um, which may suggest uh, some, uh, you know, biologically, um, this association between sort of herb expression and um, T cell signatures or cytotoxic T cell signatures. And, um, and so we think that this is a very powerful um, tool. In the past, there was only 
um, eight and eight ERs that were identified to correlate with perforin and granzyme in a similar type of analysis, um, but with a different pipeline. And we've been able to sort of expand this to larger numbers. And so I think we can really start to investigate what these ERs are really doing. And so, um, uh, so that was um, our develop the that was sort of our the summary of our the development of Irv Map and um, we've now taken this Irv Map tool to look more um, in detail how these endogenous retroviruses um, might be playing a role in disease and and the disease that we are focusing on is, is systemic lupus erythematosus or SLE um, and this and and we chose this disease um, initially because there had been implications of Irv's in this disease in the past. Um, however, there had been no mechanistic um, uh, understanding of how these herbs are potentially contributing to disease. Um, and so we really wanted to um, use our herb map tool to see if we can expand our understanding of herbs in, in SLE disease. And, um, and, and so SLE is a systemic or systemic autoimmune disease. And this is, um, this affects roughly 1.5 million Americans with lupus and over 5 million people worldwide. Um, despite the sort of health burden that we observe with lupus, there's actually only one FDA approved biologic. And this was um, uh, approved in 2011, and this is called Belovimab. It's an anti-BAF um, monoclonal antibody. Um, and one of the, the, the biggest challenge with SLE is that it is uh, systemic and very, very heterogeneous in clinical manis manifestations. So we know that there are contributing factors that um, contribute to disease development, including sort of the genetic components, um, the, uh, the sex of the individual. So this is a very female dominant disease. Um, it's a nine to one female to male ratio. Um, there are, uh, we know that um, Asians, East Asian uh, individual, um, individuals who are uh, uh, Asians or um, East Asian African Americans actually have more severe disease than Caucasians. Um, hormones, environment, and sort of age all to sort of contribute to the pathogenesis of this disease. Um, and, and and this leads to a really wide range of clinical manifestation that's systemic, right? So you have disease um, and inflammation that you can see in the skin. Uh, this is a very, butterfly rash is a very um, well-known um, uh, clinical manifestation of initial clinical manifestation of lupus. But um, th this disease, this autoimmune disease affects all organs. Um, and, you know, um, when it's not treated and when you can't, um, um, sort of tamper the, the inflammatory response, you end up with kidney uh, failure um, and, and one can succumb to death. And so uh, this is a, a major a health issue. And, and the challenge clinically is that because this disease is so heterogene heterogeneous in between and, and so different between individuals that one drug um, can't affect and treat all of these symptoms. And so we really need a better way to um, uh, segregate these just different uh, symptoms, different disease manifestations, and, and really understand the underlying um, component in, in, of, of these um, clinical manifestations. And, and that is going to help uh, develop uh, better therapeutics, personalized clothes that's closer to personalized medicine that can actually lead to differential treatments of, um, of disease. And so we wanted to apply our IRV map to really investigate um, whether endogenous retroviruses in our hands and through our analysis um, is differentially expressed in SLE, and potentially that can have a contributing uh, that can contribute to uh, inflammation in, in SLE. So we um, again started with RNA sequencing data. This is data that um, we uh, obtained through our, our Yale cohort um, SLE patients, um, and we saw with our cohort that um, or endogenous retroviruses are elevated, significantly elevated in SLE compared to healthy controls. Um, I apologize for the colors. So the green is supposed to be SLE and the orange is supposed to be healthy here. We've um, further confirmed this in a larger cohort of uh, SLE patients. Um, and this is RNA sequencing data that was published by Genentech through their ROSE trial. Um, and you know, even with the larger cohort of SLE patients, you can see that a significant
significant proportion of SLE patients have expressed higher levels of endogenous retroviruses compared to healthy controls. And again, these are proviral, locus-specific herbs that we're looking at. And um, we've identified roughly um, over 100 distinct, uh, distinct differentially expressed herb loci in SLE patients and in both cohorts. Um, and, and so the rest of the talk will be on, on this cohort here. Um, and this is sort of expanding beyond previous um, investigations that have shown, you know, two real main herb loci um, implicated in SLE, and now we have sort of over 100 herb, lo herb loci to, to work with. So I think this is a great advancement in our understanding. Um, so then we took these herb uh, expression data and we correlated with some uh, with cor clinical correlates of disease. So for example, here we're looking at um, autoantibody levels, so um, auto, uh, autoimmune diseases um, uh, with patients who have autoimmune diseases will have um, autoantibodies and specifically in lupus patients, they will have autoantibodies against nucleic acids. So anti-nuclear antibodies, anti-double-stranded DNA antibodies, or anti-RMP, these are all very uh, classic, well-established markers of um, autoantibody development in, in lupus. And we see a positive correlation between autoantibody levels and the expression of herbs in these, in these patients. And so um, given this, we then wanted to um, ask, you know, whether not just at the transcriptome level, but our viral proteins that are encoded by these proviral herbs, um, would they have any impact on inflammation um, in, in this disease? And so we mined through the, our database that we have and um, out, of our, out of the 3,220 herbs that are in the HerbMap database, roughly 87 are HerbK um, family members. And as I mentioned earlier, HerbK is a homo sapiens specific endogenous retroviruses. Um, and within the IRVK family, um, there are 12 that encode a, uh, an envelope protein. And so we, we focused on these IRV, um, 12 envelope coding IRVK family members and, and specifically found that K102, K110, um, K106, and K115 are significantly elevated in SLA patients at the transcriptome level um, compared to healthy controls. Um, furthermore, specifically focusing on these IRVKs, we found that um, sort of consistent with SLA disease uh, uh, phenotype that IRVK 102, 110, 115, and 106 are um, elevated in females. Um, and this seems to be a female, uh, uh, but not in males. And this seems to be a female dominant signature. Um, again, consistent with what you see in SLE. And then we also observed that um, in particular K102, uh, 110, 115, and 106 are highly elevated in patients and SLE patients who have high, who also have a high interferon stimulated um, and, uh, metric uh, score. So these patients have high interferon signature scores um, and they, this seems to correlate uh, with the, the herb expression here as well. Um, we confirmed that um, the IRV K102 that we see highly elevated in, in RNA sequencing is actually, it is K102 sort of by traditional Sanger sequencing. So we um, designed a pan IRV K primer based on a previous study, um, looking at just the surface unit of this envelope protein um, compared SLA patients and, human, and healthy donor PBMCs and sequenced these um, IRV, K1, uh, IRV K bands. And we did indeed find by um, traditional sort of colony sequencing analysis that they do um, align most closely with K102. All of these colonies that we pulled out were K102. And so we can, um, so we continue to pursue um, the, the, the inflammatory consequences of this K102 by generating a IRV K102 recombinant protein. So we took these IRV K102 <clears throat> sequences from patients, um, precisely from these um, amplified, ampl uh, from these amplicons. We generated a, um, a recombinant protein, a GST recombinant protein, um, and purified them, and, and then used this for uh, downstream functional assays. So what we uh, wanted to do was, um, given that uh, SLE patients um, 
uh, have autoantibodies against all antigens, we um, uh, asked whether these ERV-K102 um, envelope proteins and antigens can actually be self-antigens that are targeted by SLE, IgG. So we compared um, IgG from healthy or SLE plasma um, using either luminex assay or uh, RNA-ELISA. Um, and, and what we found was that um, uh, SLA patients do indeed have um, antibodies against ERF-K102 that's represented by both IgG1 and IgG2. Um, and, and this is um, compared to sort of uh, canonical, well-established self-antigens like Rho and C1Q, or an, a sort of vaccine antigens that we're all, um, we're, we've all seen, um, which are primarily IgG1 uh, a dominant signature, whereas these um, anti-ERV antibodies that we see in SLA patients were um, both IgG1 and, and IgG2. Um, so further characterizing what these anti rf k 102 IgGs may uh, potentially be doing in this disease, um, we found that they, they don't necessarily correlate with disease signature um, or the dis disease severity. So SLA DAI is a, um, a clinical score uh, for SLE disease severity. And, and there wasn't a significant correlation between the amount of IgG and SLA, SLA DAI. Um, these, this uh, IgG, anti-RFK-102 IgG actually um, does seem pretty stable um, over the course of six to 12 months. So um, the, the, there's no uh, really big fluctuation in the, um, the level of IgG you know, within the short time frame that we looked at. Um, however, we did observe that the level of, of IgG per individual, this uh, the level of anti-RFK102 IgG per individual did directly correlate with ISG expression or interferon-stimulated gene expression, suggesting that, um, you know, overall, although this it doesn't correlate with disease severity, there is um, a correlation between the amount of SLE, uh, amount of anti-RFK102 IgG present in SLE patients and the interferon-stimulated uh, interferon stimulated gene expression that we see heightened in, in SLA patients, as I mentioned earlier. Furthermore, what we found um, was that, um, you know, when we generated immune complexes with um, these ERF-K102 antigens um, to see whether immune complex mediated uh, function can be discerned. Um, so here what we're doing is uh, conjugating a recombinant K102 antigen uh, that's uh, FITZ conjugated with either healthy or SLE plasma, feeding to feed them in this case, looking at neutrophil, fibros neutrophil function. What we found was that um, these immune complexes that are generated with um, SLE plasma, um, so SLE IgG, both plasma and IgG purified, um, uh, these immune complexes are actually um, more readily phagocytosed by neutrophils um, when they are generated with SLE plasma compared to healthy controls. So again, there's um, this suggests that there's something functionally distinct um, about uh, dysfunctionally distinct, um, uh, uh, these uh, the antibodies against K102 is functionally distinct, um, it, despite the fact that it doesn't, um, uh, you know, overall correlate with the disease um, severity, right? So there's there's something functionally distinct about these antibodies. So we kind of we um, pursued this question a little bit further to ask what that, um, how this could be. Um, and what we found was that this um, enhanced neutrophil phagocytosis score, or antibody dependent neutrophil phagocytosis that we see, um, uh, it does correlate with the amount of IgG2 specifically. So, as I mentioned earlier, um, anti rfk K102 IgG is represented both by IgG1 and IgG2. And what we found was that um, the enhanced um, neutrophil phagocytosis that, uh, phenotype that we saw is, is directly correlated with the amount of anti rfk K102 IgG2. And we further found that this enhanced neutral phagocytosis phenotype that we see was dependent on um, high uh, affinity binding to FC gamma receptor 3B. And so when we take these ERF-K102 immune complexes um, and de determine um, you know, how well they bind to various FC gamma receptors, um, we found that FC gamma receptor 3B is actually um, 
uh, the, uh, the binding to FCGMR receptor 3B um, uh, correlated strongest to our enhanced, enhanced neutral phagocytosis that we observed. And in fact, when you block FC gamma receptor 3B on neutrophils, um, FC gamma receptor 3B is the most abundantly expressed FC gamma receptors on neutrophils. So when you block this FC gamma receptor using an anti-CD16 antibody uh, compared to isotype, you actually see partial reduction in this enhanced and neutrophil phagocytosis um, score, suggesting that um, in part, you know, the enhanced neutrophil phagocytosis that we see of these ERV K102 to immune complexes in SLE is uh, mediated through um, uh, SC gamma receptor 3B binding and interaction. Um, we further um, asked whether this uh, functional differences in anti rfk 102 IgG is due to um, various glycam modification on the IgG itself. Um, and uh, so there are, you know, a variety of glycam modifications that can affect functionality of of IgGs, um, and this has been shown to regulate, you know, differential binding to FC gamma receptors um, and sort of inflammatory capabilities, and and even affect vaccine effic uh, efficacy. And so, um, we wondered whether this functional difference in the anti of K102 IgG between SLE and healthy was actually due to um, glycam modification. Um, and, and, and what we saw was that when we looked across different glycam modifications, looking at the, the actual glycans that are listed here, um, we did see a slight increase in fucosylation um, in, in SLE IgG uh, compared to healthy, although it was, uh, was not significant, but there is a slight increase in this um, fucosylation, which does dictate FC gamma receptor 3B binding. So potentially this is in part contributing again to this um, enhanced neutrophil phagocytosis phenotype that we saw. And finally, um, what we observed uh, with this um, immune complex, uh, ERF-K102 immune complex, is that when neutrophils um, uh, phagocytose these immune complexes, they actually become activated. And so these are neutrophils that were um, incubated with either healthy K102 immune complex um, immune complexes um, containing SLE IgG, SLE plasma with beads alone, or SLE plasma alone. And you can see that it's very specifically this anti um 102 IgG uh, immune complex generated with SLE IgG um, did promote this neutrophil activation that led to this formation of neutrophil extracellular traps or nets. Um, and these are uh, spewing of uh, an extra intracellular nucleic acid um, into the extracellular um, uh, 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 extracellular space. Um, and then I apologize for missing the legend here, but the, the yellow is um, is looking at uh, neutrophil elastase and red is looking at uh, citronated H3. And so we're looking at both neutrophil uh, uh, extracellular trap formation and also neutrophil elastase and citronated H3, um, histone H3 uh, marks generated in, in, this, in this context. And so, um, and, and this is relevant for SLE disease because um, netosis is actually well established to drive inflammation in SLE um, by providing a lot of inflammatory stimuli in the extracellular space that can then lead to activation of other innate immune cells like dendritic cells. And so we think that um, potentially ERV uh, K102 and the induction of K102 can contribute to in part um, part of this inflammatory process in, in lupus. And finally, um, just to wrap up in the, in the final couple of minutes, um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, that um, dysregulation of herbs um, occur um, via reduced epigenetic silencing. And so this is something that I showed earlier where, you know, crab zinc finger proteins um, are, are sequence specific repressors of endogenous retroviruses. And when, when this is not, uh, when, when, there is an, uh, when there is a lack of epigenetic silencing, you now have um, expression of these transcripts. And so in our lupus scenario, we wanted to then see if this dysregulation of endogenous retroviruses is, is, is due to this um, epigenetic, reduced epigenetic silencing. And so one um, uh, area that we investigated was whether um, 
you know, uh, factors such as TRIM28, which is an adapter uh, for crab zinc finger proteins that recruits uh, the epigenetic silencing machinery, um, is differentially expressed in SLE versus healthy. And, actually, and indeed, um, TRIM28 expression is, is significantly reduced in SLE patients. And that negatively correlates with the expression of the K102, 115, 110, and 106 that I had shown earlier, which are these envelope coding of Ks that are significantly elevated in SLE patients. And so, what we think um, is that, you know, there is a, 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 a direct correlation between sort of reduced TRIM28 epigenetic silencing machinery and uh, elevated expression of ERV-K um, of, 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 of K loci. Um, and this is a, a different way of seeing this where we see um, not just TRIM28, but other components of um, this epigenetic silencing machinery that is negatively regulated in SLE compared to healthy controls. And this is what you're seeing in lock two fold change. So in, in uh, so below uh, below this uh, x axis is what is negatively or, um, reduced, uh, where there's reduced expression of, of these genes in SLE compared to healthy controls, and then down here we're looking at uh, a, a heat map of these. Um, correlation one one on one correlations where um, here again K102 um, negatively correlates with trim 28 expression suggesting that there's an inverse sort of relationship between trim 28 and K or K expression um, and so on and so forth for a variety of these um, epigenetic silencing um, complexes. Okay. Um, so um, just to conclude here, um, what what I've shown you today um, is that uh, we developed this uh, RNA sequencing um, analysis method called IRVMAP that detects locus specific proviral IRV expression. Um, and this, uh, it, in using IRVMAP, we found that IRV proviral IRV expression alone can and discriminate different cell types. Um, we can further use this uh, database not just for RNA sequencing, but also to look at genomic um, chip seq data um, and, and reveal various system marks that can correlate with the actual mRNA expression. Um, we, we can use this um, to further uh, identify disease-associated ERVs um, and then uh, characterize these ERVs for their potential function in immunomodulation. And so as an example of this, I showed you in SLE that K102 is, uh, that we identified the IRV map is highly elevated in SLE, correlating with interferon signature. Um, and this, um, and this we think is sort of negatively correlated with epigenetic siling, silencing machinery and suggesting that in these patients sort of reduced epigenetic silencing is, is causing this elevated IRVK or, or leading to uh, this IRVK expression. And once these are expressed, um, if they form immune complexes with um, uh, uh, autoantibodies, then they can really readily be phagocytosed by neutrophils and lead to activation of, of, of these neutrophils um, to secrete nets. And so, um, you know, we can actually then take this data. I only showed you one example in, um, in one disease, but we can take a similar approach to really understand the mechanism of epigenetic and transcriptional regulation of many of these um, ERVs that are differentially regulated in SLE. And then further downstream, um, uh, sort of characterize how they're relevant for immune surveillance, innate immune activation in this disease, um, and potentially be used not uh, to sort of further reveal biological relevance of these herbs, but um, can be used for patient stratification and, bi and biomicro development. And, and we can even expand this to looking at other autoimmune diseases or any other inflammatory diseases as well. And so just to conclude here, um, my lab is, uh, is officially open as of March 1st, and we're at the Department of Micro, uh, Microbiology and Immunology at University of British Columbia in Vancouver. Um, and if you're interested in learning more about our work, please visit our lab website. Um, I am also on Twitter. And um, in, in here, we are really interested in you know, defining and characterizing um, sort of uh, how our proteins are interacting with cellular counterparts, specifically in, in immune cells, and how that impacts their function and physiology such that, you know, in, in the case, for example, I showed you an example in, in lupus and neutrophils, but how that contributes to downstream consequence, consequences during inflammatory responses.
Um, we are also um, committed to um, diversity and inclusion and equity in our lab. Um, our mission statement is listed here. I really believe that we're all collectively connected as scientists um, and that it's important that we value representation of diverse individuals who come from various backgrounds. Um, and so as a team, we are really committed to reforming institutional culture and policies that perpetuate racism and exclusion in, in science. Um, and with that, I like to acknowledge um, uh, uh, Akiko Iwasaki, who is my postdoc mentor, um, and, and the rest of the lab where all of this work was was done. Um, and this was at Yale University and in the funding sources here. I've had many collaborators on various projects. Um, and Yang Kong is uh, sort of my my other half um, who has uh, really been working with me since the beginning of this on developing uh, various uh, bioinformatics um, analysis tools and, and various methods to analyze endogenous retroviruses. Um, and I've also had a, a number of clinical collaborators at Yale and beyond. And so um, here are my acknowledgments. And, and thank you so much. I'd be happy to take any questions. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing. Okay. Uh, Great. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for this amazing presentation. Uh, we were struggling for a couple of months with our internet connection, but I'm still here. Uh, if by any chance I am disconnected, uh, yeah, it's home and she will be able to take my place. So let's switch to our class. It's a difficult day for our internet connection here at our local university. But uh, moving forward, um, so... I'm uh, sorry, uh, Maria, are you uh, understanding I'm not, anything? I'm not hearing, I'm not hearing you too well, right. Fabio. But Hi, I, I'm sorry. Um, yeah. I'm another member of the, okay. the CAC, and uh, what he was saying was that the internet is really bad today. So oh, no! <laughs> not we are having not a able... little bit of trouble <laughs> with the not... transmission. Um, were you not able to hear the talk, or no? No, well, we could understand everything that you were presenting. It was just that uh, the transmission to YouTube might have had some trouble, but uh, we, we always recorded at the Meet, uh, the Google Meet, uh, yeah. So we can we are able to load it afterwards okay. with no interruptions or anything like okay. that. Okay. Sure. But the communication is a little bit tough for okay. um, for Fabio who is in the university right now. I see. So okay. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm no taking problem. a, yeah, no a problem. little bit over here. That's and okay. I want to thank you a lot for the opportunity of hearing about your work and uh, uh, you. all the data you showed us. And I think I'm gonna uh, call Julio Schaffenstein, who's a professor at our. Oh, uh, university to ask the direct question to you at the, right now. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Maria Tokiyama. It was a fantastic talk, and uh, we could understand and, and, and hear extremely well everything okay. that you said. So it was very stimulating. Great. Science for everybody, indeed. Uh, I would like to ask you something that uh, really uh, raised my curiosity mm -hmm. uh, regarding the the, the fine specificity of the antibodies that you have detected in these patients, mm -hmm. uh, which actually you use them uh, for the assays uh, with neutrophils and, and, and perhaps, you know, trying to get some insight about the functional implications of the, of the antibodies. Mm -hmm. uh, since there is, you know, this is a historical associations with complement deficiency. Mm -hmm. I just wonder if, you know, beyond knowing the fine specificity of the antibodies mm -hmm. and considering that the levels of the uh, ERB, ERV K102 antigens may vary a lot. Mm -hmm. So stoichiometry could be uh, very important. So it's not just, you know, looking to the titers and, and trying to see whether you have a correlation, mm -hmm. but also the stoichiometry of the immune complexes Yep. And then I wonder if you ever had the opportunity to do a proteomic analysis to see whether you had enhanced incorporation or deficit in the incorporation of complement components. Because it's very funny, but uh, mm -hmm. in the late 70s, I was working on, on, on that specific problem, which has to do with the effect of complement activation in the regulation of the lattice. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, so, I mean, since you have those associations with complement, uh, I just wonder if you know something about the qualitative uh, 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 component of the immune complexes, because yeah. that actually influence how the neutrophils are responding. Yes, yeah. Uh, well, essay. So I think it, it could be an interesting question. Yeah, no, I think that's a fantastic question. Thank you so much for uh, your curiosity and your question. I really appreciate it. I love this engagement. Um, and I completely agree with you that there might be other sort of uh, serum components, including complement, that could be affecting this effect. I think, um, although we haven't done an, an exhaustive uh, investigation on this, we did look at purified IgG. So we purified IgG out of plasma um, using sort of IgG purification methods which would sort of eliminate any of these plasma or serum component, um, protein components. So we still see in an enhancement in neutrophil phagocytosis. So um, although it doesn't um, just, uh, you know, do, you know, I don't, I, I don't think we've eliminated the possibility that other factors are contributing to the overall effect of neutral phagocytosis, um, we have seen that IgG, purified IgG is alone is sufficient to induce this neutrophil phagocytosis. But I think you have a really great point, you know, in, in physiological settings, uh, obviously we're not gonna have purified IgG, um, right? And so um, in, in that scenario, I think it is really, um, uh, something that we can we can look at. Um, we've actually talked to our collaborators initially about looking at uh, the the char characterizing these anti RFK one hundred two IgGs a little bit better. And one thing that we can actually do is look for complement opposition um, on these IgGs specifically. And so that is um, something that we could. Yeah, definitely do and and can contribute to the overall phenotype. I agree with you. Yeah. On the structural basis, uh, you don't know exactly what yeah, are I don't, I don't, yeah. in in this complex, right? Yeah. Okay. I don't know. I don't have a structural yeah information on that. Yeah. Thank you. I'm sure that my colleagues have a lot of questions. Thank you so okay. much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Julio. Uh, I'll, I'll ask everyone who had who would like to pose a direct question to Dr. Maria to uh, raise your hand through the application because uh, my connection is also not very good and sometimes opening the camera is not enough because I, I can't see all the open cameras. So um, we have several uh, messages uh, thanking you and, and uh, saying that it was, it was a wonderful talk. And uh, I will call for Ulysses who's also would like to make a direct uh, question to you. Yeah. And thank you again, Lisa, for making the bridge such that we have Dr. Maria here to give us a talk. Maria, congratulations. It was a wonderful talk, very informative. Thank you. And uh, I think that uh, people are thinking about the models and the, the role of herbs in several situations. Mm -hmm. So I was thinking about uh, the model of uh, lupus that you present and the expression of the RFK. And what's thinking about the situation? Uh, you think that a chronic inflammation, like in lupus, would lead to epigenetic change, mm -hmm. so uh, uh, making the earth transcriptional core, right. or could it be some event? Mm -hmm. event then you have uh, this earth transcription, mm -hmm. and they have a sustained uh, inflammatory response. Right. Major by innate uh, response and so on. So, yeah. what do you think? Thank you, Alyssa. This is very, th again, thank you for this opportunity. I really appreciate it. And um, I really enjoyed uh, connecting with you um, over Zoom the, this past uh, six months. Uh, and, and this is a great question. I think um, it's still, I don't, uh, I think one evidence I have is that when I treat uh, human PBMCs with interferon itself, um, just to ask the question of whether the inflammatory um, trigger can induce herb expression. Um, that alone doesn't seem to be sufficient in our hands um, to be to derive herb K102 or these herb K induction in in healthy PBMCs, right? And so, although um, you know, I think it's hard to do the experiment of sort of then. Um, you know, what would happen if you also, in addition to, to this, have already an epigenetic dysregulation, and then on top of that, come in with sort of an inflammatory stimuli, then we'll just see an induction of herbs, because you might need to sort of 
prepare um, these sites um, to, to be open first before the inflammatory stimuli comes, right? And we can't really mirror that in, in healthy PBMC. So it's possible that the, the experiment can uh, can be optimized a little bit more. But um, but that with data would suggest that sort of inflammatory cues alone is not sufficient. I think okay. um, there is a combination of these, both a, a sort of an epigenetic component and inflammatory component that could be involved in, in the, the induction of herbs. Yeah. Okay, so if I may, may I make another question? Yeah, sure, sure. Okay, uh, so if I'm not wrong, the Earth K expression is sustained for a long time. Mm -hmm. I think that was for months. So mm -hmm. it seems that there is no uh, negative regulatory loop in the epigenetic uh, control of expression. So what do you think about uh, so, what's happening um, in this scenario? Right. So the so the data for the the longitudinal um, data that I showed you was actually looking at the antibody response. So those were looking at the antibodies against RFK102, and, and the antibody titers don't seem to. Okay. To, right. Um. And and I haven't looked to see whether there's sustained or. K expression at the transcriptome level. Um, that's actually a really great point to kind of look at whether there is a an on and off switch. Um, although, you know, if if it is uh, sort of kind of following up with your former idea of whether inflammatory um, stimuli can sort of then drive expression, there could be multiple factors that are contributing to this expression. And if sort of inflammatory milieu is is in part contributing to the expression of RFK, which um, I, I don't have a definitive answer for that yet in SLA. But okay. if it is, then you can see that uh, you would imagine that sort of uh, there wouldn't, you know, unless there is, uh, you know, drug treatment or anti-inflammatory treatments that are being externally made, um, you uh, you might see a sustained expression over time. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Marika. Thank you, Ulysses. Um, we have a question from Fabio who is not being able to open his mic and because okay. we couldn't understand anything, so he, he wrote it down in the comments here. Uh, so he said, I was fascinated by the issue raised concerning the evolution of these sequences in the human genome. I wonder how long they have been um, there or accumulating. Yeah, so ERFK102 or in ERFK family specifically um, integrated into the Homo sapiens genome. Um, uh, some of these are in integrated into to the Homo sapiens genome less than a million years ago. Um, K102 in particular is very specific to um, to Homo sapiens, so you actually won't find this in any of our primate ancestors. Um, and so, uh, but you know, however, um, there are plenty of sequences in uh, endogenous retroviral or LTR sequences in our genome that is um, highly conserved through evolution. Um, and so, you know, for example, in one is con is conserved, um, is highly conserved, and and other LTR elements are as well. So to, it, it really kind of depends on which herb we're talking about and and, and which locus we're talking about. But for K one hundred two specifically, this this is a human specific herb. Okay. And do you happen to find any natural variants, so, or, or uh, I guess subspecies that don't have them? And uh, do you know if if they do exist, if they have evolutionary advantages or disadvantages? Yeah, so that's a really great question. Um, I don't have an answer, <laughs> a direct answer for this. Um, so we know that, for example, some of the Herb Ks like K115 and K113 is, there is um, uh, still an insertional polymorphism between the human population. And so um, there are different positions even in, in the, the Homo sapien uh, lineage where K113 and K115 um, seem to be polymorphic in terms of the position that you find in, in, in the human genome across individuals. And so, um, and, and that's also an evidence that this is a recent integration and not a, a very ancient integration event, but these were, these happened sort of within the Homo sapien lineage, right? Um, um, and, and beyond that, it, we don't, you know, we don't know too much about sort of natural variation of these herbs. I think these studies are being done by um, evolutionary uh, biologists in, in this field who are really interested in answering these types of questions, but we don't have a lot of answers yet, yeah. Okay, and I'm not completely sure if you mentioned it in your talk because we're dealing with the internet. Yeah. But uh, do you do you know if they play any role in a transplant uh, rejection or any uh, anything related to that? 
Yeah, um, I'm not aware of any studies um, that have looked at herbs and, and uh, transparent rejection, except for in, in pigs. <laughs> so pigs are actually, uh, pig endogenous retroviruses or PERVs have been um, studied um, in sort of CRISPR and uh, uh, CRISPR method has been applied to sort of de delete um, endogenous retroviruses in pigs um, to improve sort of transplant um, efficiency. That That is not known for, for humans, um, but there is evidence in other or organisms that that may affect transplantation as well, so. Okay, thank you, thank yeah. you. Um, do we have any any further questions? Uh, as I said, uh, we used to have a, a key that will be open the video and we call for uh, the person, but since the internet has been oh, okay. oscillated, we, we have to wait for the little hand to raise in case oh, sorry, some, no uh, somebody wants to talk. To talk. Um, but um, I think that we don't, uh, and uh, so, I believe that I will uh, thank you very, very much, Dr. Maria, for uh, your time and for the discussion that we have uh, we, have, we have had here. I'm yeah. sorry for all the uh, internet distress. <laughs> no, um, no. I'm sure that, um, we usually have more uh, participating uh, participation from the YouTube uh, oh, uh, people, but I guess because of the the breaks, so they are they will be uh, waiting for us to post your your talk again oh, okay. and, uh, and yeah, answer the I'm, big I'm happy Sorry. to take additional questions um, from others by email. If anybody wants to email me, I'm happy to share my, you know, you guys have my email address, so feel free to share, share my contact information. If anybody else wants to have further discussions about this, I'm happy to have additional conversations and discussions beyond this, <laughs> this talk, so. Sure, thank, thank you. you. Thank you very, very much. And thank you. Uh, thank you all for enduring with us <laughs> the promise of the internet. And uh, I'm sure that the data helped a lot because your presentation was really amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks so much for coming. I appreciate it. Thank, thank you, you, Maria. Maria. Uh, I'm sorry for all the trouble. <laughs> no, that's okay. <laughs> Don't apologize. <laughs> it's okay. Thank you so much. I appreciate the opportunity. I appreciate it. Hope to see you guys at some point.